Okay. Let's see how this goes. So, for those seeing this video for the first time, who are new, this is part two of a stream that I just finished because YouTube decided to just absolutely crap itself. <laughs> so I'll just finish up this last rivet in the project from the last stream and then we'll get on to the next project. There we go. Hey Kenneth, welcome back. So finished up this one here. This goes here. This goes here. Look at that. Like a bought one. So the thing about these pop rivets, the first close is always tricky before the metal loosens up. Hey nope, welcome back. Alright, so there you go, look at that, finished. Another set of crochet hooks, ready to go on. Good old Etsy. Close that one up too. Look at that. Handmade crochet hook sets in beautiful leather pouches. Like a bought one. Alrighty. Now, kangaroo leather. A little trickier to work with. So, basically what we want to do is split this piece down the middle. kangaroo leather is much harder to cut than calf skin. That makes for beautiful sheets. So, this is kind of the plan. Have it sit kind of like this and get that profile cut into it. So to do that, we use what's called a scratch awl. And here is one here. Now, tanned leather, you can literally scratch and it holds the line on it. So I can trace the shape that the knife handle makes. And I don't know how this is gonna show up on the camera. See if I can get to focus properly. Boop. See the, yeah, you can kind of see that. The uh, tracing marks there, caused by the scratch all. Probably can't see it. But when you've got it scratched in like that, you can then take your very sharp Stanley knife and cut along the scratches. It's always better to do multiple light passes with a Stanley knife on leather rather than trying to force it through the whole way. You'll get neater cuts as it slices the fibers.
And when you're doing profile work like this, you really want to take the time. that. So we got this shape now. So we got this shape now. And this should hold the profile of the knife handle as it slides in. Now the reason that I like this design is that it stops rotation of the knife in the sheath like this. So, normally what you would do with a sheath is you would have um, the top layer, you'd have a copy of this on the bottom, and then you would have a thin layer of leather going around the edge. Now the reason you would do that is so that the blade doesn't hit up against the stitching. But if you were doing a sheath in this style, even though the blade is sitting in there and the stitching is exposed to it, the knife can't rotate in the sheath because of that cutout. And because it can't rotate, it never slices up against the, sh the stitching, unless when you're dragging it out, you're literally pushing it down across there, which you, you wouldn't be doing. So it's a nice little way to keep it secure and ensure that both your stitching stays protected and the knife never you know, falls loose and slides out. So we put that there. Then we can take this over to the other side. And basically do the same thing. Now you want to keep your wits about you while you're doing uh, like sort of fine carving of leather like this where it has to conform to a very specific shape because if you slip and stuff it, stuff it up then you're basically starting all over again. And a good way to stay sharp while you're doing that is to have a coffee in your system. And you can get me a coffee by going to coffee.com forward slash Valhalla Ironworks and it will keep me sharp so that I don't slip and stuff up my sheath design. The opposite side's always trickier to do. There we go. You guys can probably hear the butcher birds in the background. I talked about them on previous streams. They're adorable little things. We've, um, <laughs> one of them found a sock probably stole it from someone's clothesline, this little white sock. And he's been carrying around with him everywhere. Whenever he comes to visit, he brings the sock with him and so that, so that it's nearby. It's so cute. 
Um, but he keeps it remarkably clean, so he's hiding it somewhere. Anyway, so you can see I've got the two mating pieces that go together like that. And this way, when the knife goes into the sheath, it'll lock in nice and sweet, like that. Hey, thanks for popping by, Kenneth. Um, always, a, always a pleasure to have you here. Always a pleasure to have your support. Uh, hope you sleep well. So, I'm just going to hold the blade nice and secure. Now on this side, I actually, you can see I sort of kept it swept. Just a purely the design thing. I may do that on this one as well. Sweep that down. So, we'll see. Now would be the time to do it though, so I might do it now. Is going to eyeball it. And then match it up on this side. And eyeball that too. There you go. Nice and secure. Now I know that the person I'm sending this to is right-handed, so I've pre-done this strap. Folds over like so, and is going to hook here so that he can draw it out right-handed, like that. Nice big belt loop too. So basically what we do now is we take this line it up with our little notch here and work out how long the sheath needs to be and what sort of shape we're going to get on it so for this one I think I might do something a little a little different get a bit of a curve going to it Because I likes me my curves. There we go. Not sure if you're going to be able to pick that up on the camera. You can kind of see it, if you, especially if you're watching in HD. Add, add, just adds a little bit of class to it. So, I'll cut that out. Now remember, multiple light passes. Minimize yourself, the chances of yourself stuffing it up. So if you couldn't see the markings before, that's kind of the shape, so it'll sit in like that. Gives it a little bit more profile, especially when the stitching's sitting around there, it'll look quite nice. So now we just need to replicate this on the other piece, like so. And we can do this easier by inverting it like that and using our scratch all. Make sure the top's nice and lined up. Get the scratch all and trace. And then cut.
And it's very tempting when you're working with tanned leather like this to see how it's mostly cut, to like try and rip it free because it's just little fibers holding it. Try to avoid doing that and just give it that one last pass. Ripping out those fibers can uh, lead to messy edges which never truly sit right. So even that, that tiny little bit there, it's tempting to just pull that out but it'll leave little tufty fibers that will be the bane of your existence. So just get in there with a the knife, neatly cut them out. So there we go, basic shape done. Put that there. Fits in nicely. This is very rough at the moment, but there's this here. And that'll be the basics of the sheath. So no wet forming, nothing fancy, just a touch of class. So to start holding this together we want to, um, well before we do that we're going to have to work out where things are going to be. What I want to do is put a rivet up the top here, nice big rivet and round that over so that it's just a little bit classier looking. No reason other than the fact that it's classier looking. So what we do is we put away these because we're not using pop rivets on this project. Then we get these babies out using full-size rivets. Now, even though we're not putting the rivet in yet, we will soon, but not yet, just have it ready to the side. So the first thing I want to do is punch the holes for it so I know where they are going to sit. Now, headphone warning again, nope. This leather is much tougher to actually punch holes through. But out they come and you get nice neat holes. Look at that. Headphone warning again. go there and so we want to round those corners off a little bit we'll do that once the rivets in because that will ensure that it's a nice even cut around the entirety of the outside here okay so next thing we want to do is a small rivet that's going to go here the reason we're putting the rivets in is because these are the places that the stitching is going to end essentially so can just end it clean like this, but there's a certain amount of class to ending it in a rivet. Especially if there's, you know, a certain amount of force being applied, when you slide it in, that's going to stretch that open a little bit. And so there's going to be force applied here. So putting a rivet there just adds a little bit extra, extra nice. Phone warning. And again. Yeah, still going, Sam. 
How was your work? Man, that's a blunt punch. Eh, I'm glad you did. We finished the crochet hook pouch. Came out looking pretty swell. And now we've moved on to the stream. YouTube died on me, so I had to start a new stream. Sam Towns now including um, X Men or Marvel movie style end of credit scenes. At the end of the video, Nick Fury comes in and tells Sam that he needs to reforge Mjolnir for for Thor. I don't know how it works. So you can see I just check for alignment. I'm not going to actually fit these rivets yet. Okay, so pop that one in there, line it up, pop this one in here, and line it up, look at that. So that's kind of how they'll sit, and that allows the knife to slide in there nice and easily, and it keeps those two points nice and reinforced. But we're not going to fit them yet because we have to do a horrible process of fitting the strap. Ooh. Get my sore neck and shoulders. Oh, did you hear that neck crack? Now, he's going to be wearing this on his right hip, so it's going to have to go into this piece. Now, it's pretty straightforward. I've already marked this out here. So as long as I hold this in place, I can use my marking awl and mark those points. and they transfer across like so. I then take my number four, line it up, give you guys a headphone warning.
get my little expanding all because we're going to be going through three layers of leather here and not just any leather we're going through three layers of three mil kangaroo leather so we want nice big easy to stitch through holes And I'll show you a trick that makes that work even easier. And that trick is also thanks to my friend in Germany to whom this knife is going. Because he sent it to me. That one's already been expanded. And it is this. This Carnuba wax works a little bit like um, the rosin on the bow of a violin. Now I'm going to be using black thread for this. And I'll get plenty of it just because. Thread my needle, and you wax up your needle, and it slides through the leather much, much easier. So, what we're going to start with is we go through the first hole, through the second hole through the third hole and line it all up. And we have a set of flat faced pliers here that makes this job a little bit easier pulling it through. We pull it all the way through like we did before and then we've got to make it come all the way back through which is why we want those holes to be nice and open. And we're going to saddle stitch this all the way through just like the stitch that we did on the crochet hook case. Every so often we go back and we wax the needle through it goes again make sure you keep everything nice and tight because doing three layers of can tanned kangaroo leather you may as well be just snapping your needles and calling it good So you got to be careful. There it is. And it will start holding itself after a, a while, but until that point you want to keep good pressure on it so it doesn't get loose, because you don't want to sew it in loose. Here we go. Now, normally on something like this, if it was, say, on a larger knife or something that required a little bit more durability, you would actually glue these layers down with something like barge cement before you started stitching. However, if you glue it down and your hole alignment is off, you've got a really bad time. I don't trust my ability to glue it in line. People will put, like, positioning awls or needles in there to actually ensure it happens and everything. I, I am too early in my journey of leather working to be able to be that confident. So instead I do excessive hand stitching. And you guys get to watch me. See if you're gonna be using pliers to pull through a needle, you want to get these flat faced ones, no jimping on them it will damage the needle and kill it really quick. I'll wax this up a little bit more. Makes it go through nice and easy. This process can be nightmarish or it can be nice and smooth. And it all comes down to prior preparation. What do they call it? The five P's or six P's? Prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. <laughs> there we 
go. And then we're back at the start, so it should be a fairly strong hold now, but we will still go back through the other way and complete the saddle stitch. Now you want to be careful when you get to the beginning and you push the stitch through again that you don't pull this through with the needle because that will stuff up the whole thing. Through there. Now it should all be in line now, so it makes aligning a bit easier. And I don't have to grip it, see, because it's already being held in place. So, less frantic. You do want to try and be quick about it when you're holding a grip, because naturally your hand strength will go fade as you get tired, and you won't have consistent pressure which means that you won't have a consistent stitch. Tell you what, I am inside in aircon. The aircon is set to 24 degrees or I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit in your weird, crazy American temperature scale. Um, but it's, it's nice and cool. It should be nice and cool. But it is so hot outside, I can feel it coming through the walls, and it's still making me sweat. If you guys aren't careful, I'm going to have to go Matthew McConaughey and take my shirt off. And nobody wants to see that. much as I miss being in my forge right now, dreadfully. Wouldn't want to be in there in this weather. <laughs> yeah, everyone knows about our bromance now. What in the hell was that? Yeah, stuff that up. Back we go. I got distracted by Sam's sexy time comments. Sam distracts me a lot. That handsome man. That's better. Almost done. And I love how Sam's comment before is like, make sure you watch all the way to the end of the video as if I don't watch every second of video that Sam ever produces. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure, Sam, every time you walk past a reflective surface. Ooh. Hello there. Oh, my. Sometimes you're going to struggle to find your alignment when you're doing something as complex as three layers of leather. Um... Search for it gently. It's how you kill needles by misaligning and then applying too much force. You'll feel it. You just sort of rotate the needle around, you know, sort of pivot it in the hole, and you'll feel it pop into the into the into alignment. So, oh, wax is so handy. I'm so glad Stefan sent it to me.
Thank you, Stefan, if you're watching this in post. I'm sure you will. He's on a business trip at the moment, so he probably will appreciate having something to watch. Back when I used to live in my uh, corporate job, I'd have to travel for work quite a bit, flying around the country, and um, it becomes this blur of hotel rooms and mini bars and you know unfamiliar city streets. Sounds good when you first start, but takes its toll. Oh, the last stitch is always the trickiest. There we go. There it is. Dunsky. Now that'll be the hardest stitching part of this whole sheet because the only one that's got three layers. Because as I said earlier, in case you missed it, um, this particular style of sheath that I'm doing doesn't need to have the buffer layer to protect the stitching because when the knife goes in, it's locked from rotating um, by the cutout here and the blade is actually well away from the stitching so it never actually has force applied to it or pressure against it. It's an oversized sheath that is knife but it's just it works out well. It's kind of this minimalist look that, I don't know, it works well for me. I like it. Not as good for large knives. Plenty good for small knives. Alright, touch of glue. We're only going to put glue on one side because super glue hardens and will impede the knife. Now, if you want to be pedantic about this and you want to protect this from the knife going in and out of the sheath, I won't be on this sheath, but if you do want to, get yourself a bit of epoxy resin and put that over there, just like five minute resin or something, and just keep it horizontal while it dries and it will dry into this, it sort of soaks into the leather and creates this smooth protective coating over the stitching works really really well um, what I've done on this one is I've actually angled it, you see it's more of a rhombus than a square so when the knife goes into the sheath it won't actually uh, interact with it unless he's sort of putting it at this angle but even then it's it's hard to because of the shape of the knife it's got quite a uh, um, a short distal taper towards the end so as it's going in the point is lifted off the surface and will bypass the rhombus because he's aligning it with the, the hole. So I could do the extra step, not going to for this particular project. So now what we're going to do is that groove that I told you about. We actually groove in around the outside where the stitching will sit. So to do that, we use a tool called a groove skyver. Now, these are pretty cool. Don't know how well this is going to translate to video, but it carves out a little U-shaped channel in the leather. See if you can see that. See that groove there? That now gives me a area that I can put my stitching chisels into. And it makes for a nice 
stitch. Now, in order to make sure that my stitching chisels line up correctly, I need to match that on the other side. So to do that, I lay the pieces out thusly, and make sure I start in the same position because the stitching chisels are going to be do exactly the same spacing of stitching on both sides. Now, if you're just starting out in leather work, well, I could have. However, um, there's a risk of weakening the, the, the stitching point if I do that. What Sam's talking about, for those playing who haven't done any leather working, is a tool like this. So I've got a little curved blade there, and you can kind of drag it across the leather, and it thins it. It takes off thin slices of it at a time to thin it out. However, this is quite tight stitching and it doesn't really cause a problem, but it is a, it is definitely a uh, technique you can use. Um, it does weaken the area where the stitching is because thinner leather that it's going into. However, in the case of a knife this small, it's not really an issue. This has got a bit of weight to it. It's probably about 250 grams because um, it's, it's hand forged rather than stock removal but um, won't be an issue for this particular instance. Um, oh, sorry, it was Note that said that. Um, another thing that you may notice is that I did the grooving by hand. That's something that you will do when you're more familiar with how leather responds. Um, what you would normally use is something like this, which has a little... I'll show you how it works. a little gauge thing on um, on the side of it and you can actually drag it around see how it holds holds an exact distance all the way around you can use one of these um, after a while you just sort of can freehand it which is what I did with this project also have this quite nice one which is very pleasant to use. Alright, so what we can do now is start doing our stitching punches. Now, since we've got some curves... Hey, Sam's leatherworking too. I like it. Leatherworking buddies. Alright, so headphone warning guys. I'm going to close this up because I don't want it bouncing everywhere. Now this time I'm not going all the way through with them, I'm just marking them first. other side and make sure they line up
lines up well. This side. Hey Sam, are you using any of those tools I sent you? Sorry, this one's a little quiet. It takes a bit of concentration to line it all up. Nice. Alright, so now that we've got that done and lined up, I'm going to punch the final holes. One lesson you will learn if you ever take up leather working is that you cannot unpunch a hole. So marking everything out, measuring it, very important. And really that's a lesson for life in general. You can't unpunch a hole. I'm so I'm sure there's a poignant metaphor somewhere in that. <laughs> I'm leaving a trail. It's good. Better to punch nice clean holes.
Okay. One side nice and punched. Neat and in the grooves is what you want to see. Now we do this one. I know you're losing the beautiful reflection of my face. There we go. Quite proud of my little mirror idea. It allows me to give you a very clear view of what's going on for any uh, intrepid leather worker hopefuls that like seeing the process. There you go. Look at that. Two evenly punched sides. They now go together like this. We'll rivet them, we'll stitch them. And we'll have ourselves a sheath. Then we're going to go through and um, corner sky the edges, burnish the edges, and dye the entire sheath, which is pretty cool to watch. Right, so, <clears throat> do the big in first. Check the fit. Lovely. And then we stitch. Stick with the black thread. Grab a good amount of it.
We get our needle, we get our wax. We are set. So, while we're stitching, let's have a conversation. I worked in psychology for the longest time. A theory called, uh, a uh, field called behavioral economics. Specifically, I was a behavioral game theorist. And it leads to me coming up with all sorts of fairly philosophical questions that I tend to ask people. And so, one of them, my most popular one, I like to call the genie question. So I'm going to ask you the genie question, because I'm interested to hear people's answers. Now the genie question goes like this. You're walking along through a desert, or anywhere really, and you find a magic lamp. You rub the magic lamp, out comes a genie. And the genie, rather than saying to you, you have three wishes, he says something different. He says you have one wish. And it cannot be a wish for yourself. It has to be a wish for the world. You are allowed to change the world in one way. Just one. What would it be? And whatever you wish doesn't have to be realistic. It just has to be a one way that you would change the world. And what would it be? Now, whenever I ask people this question, they like to give me what I call the Miss Universe answers. And I, <laughs> I often joke about it because people are like, you know, world peace. They want world peace. And, you know, as a behavioral economist, I know that that's not, not the solution to problems. Humans are aggressive, warring creatures. World peace does not fix a lot of things like disease. It doesn't fix, um, you know, domestic violence. It doesn't fix all sorts of problems that, you know, children who lose their parents. So I tell them, that's great, the Miss Universe answer, but what, what's your real answer? What, <laughs> that's, what would you really do? And we have a discussion based on them coming up with the answer and sometimes they have an answer very quickly other times it takes them like one of the students that I was mentoring at the local university took two weeks to come up with an answer and his answer was a good one but before I tell you what it was the point of this question is because while Bruce Lee said a goal is often not meant to be reached it's just something to aim at and while you may have a goal for how you would love the world, to see the world change, but realistically, and I know this sounds a bit pessimistic, but realistically, you can't change the entire world. You're one person. Very few people get to change the world. Some people do. Some people manage to do it. But what you can do is change your world, regardless of who you are or who you think you are. You influence people. And those people go on to influence other people. So knowing the th one thing that you would love to see different about the world, knowing what that is, it shapes your actions, which then go on to have far-reaching effects throughout your life and past your life into the lives of other people and then thus the, the lives of them and so on and so forth. That's why I believe in mentoring so much. Um, but knowing for sure, knowing what your answer to the genie question is, creates a goal, something that you can sort of visualize as a distant mountain. And every time you do something in life, you can ask yourself, is this taking me closer to or further away from the mountain? And if it's taking you further away from it, you shouldn't be doing it. But if it's taking you closer to it, even in an oblique way, it's a good thing and it's worth doing because it is getting, bringing you closer to your mountain. And you may go your whole life without ever reaching that mountain, but the journey that you take now means that future people with that same goal don't have to travel as far. 
like how many people are standing upon the shoulders of giants from the past and even on incidental little things in your world that is still very much the same how many people have influenced you in your life to make you who you are and those people were just people too they weren't just these superhuman great gods of history like Tesla and Einstein and that they were just people but they had a huge resounding impact on you and your life and how you think of things and how you see things and how you handle things and you are going to be one of those people for someone else and it's easy to think that you wouldn't be but you'd be surprised and oftentimes we don't find out until much later in our lives that we were that person for someone or sometimes we never find out because the people who are influenced by us are silent so ask yourself the genie question what would you change about the world and the ment- mentee of mine, who I said took two weeks to come up with an answer, decided that he wanted a world where people can feel safe. He wouldn't, you know, there's, there's so much that you have to be afraid of nowadays illness, um, violence, cybercrime, um, identity theft, political corruption, all these things. There's, there's so much to be afraid of, and the world seems to be geared towards keeping you in a state of being afraid and people are often even afraid of themselves and what's going on in their own mind and he wanted a world where people don't have to be afraid and everything he does now he asks himself is this helping achieve that goal or work closer to that goal because even if he can only make five people be less afraid in their life then that's five people who will go on to continue influencing people through their lives and then the people that they influence will influence others and so on and so forth my answer to the genie question is that I believe that human knowledge should be freely accessible I don't believe in paywalls for it I don't believe that location or race or financial backing or anything like that should have any bearing on being able to learn which is why as somebody who is obsessed with learning new things, which is why you see me doing robotics and leather work and blacksmithing and all this sort of thing, I love to share that knowledge. And that's my way of trying to reach my mountain. Every chance that I get to pass on knowledge, I take that opportunity because it takes me to my mountain. And it defines who I am as a person. And it defines the choices that I make and the actions that I take. I don't hide secret skills from people I'm good at a lot of things but I will openly and happily teach others so I'm very keen to see if any of you are able to what would your answer be to the genie or is it something that you think you need a lot more time to be able to think of I do believe it's a, an important question to ask yourself because it defines who you are Sometimes the answer might be selfish, it might be something that just you want. You know, you don't care about the rest of the world. And to be honest, mine is like that. I grew up in a very, very small country town where access to knowledge, and it was in the 90s, you know, 80s and 90s, there was no internet back then, so libraries were the closest thing you had to being able to research stuff, or hopefully finding one of these wise people that uh, were masters of certain crafts and learning from them. So it was a lot harder, but now you can just go on YouTube, like you guys are, and watch some schmo in another country doing something and teaching you about it. So it's a lot easier, and I love that, and I wanted to be a part of that, which is why I'm streaming, because, uh, you know, it's all sorts of different things that I do, and you guys can all learn from it. So um, I am doing it because I like learning. So if I am setting the example, more people will hopefully follow Hey, V-Man's in the room. You're missing some highly, deeply philosophical discussion, V-Man. How's, how's it going? How is lunch? What are you having?
Ne? <lacht> Hopefully your silence is because you are trying to comprehend your answer to the genie question and are struggling. If you can come up with the answer to it easily, then maybe you should rethink your answer. I guarantee you if I were using sewing needles, which I have done in the past, I would have stabbed myself about 18 times just in this row. I think it might actually do some work to widen these holes and align them a little bit. But man, you guys keep getting sprung with the deep philosophical waxing on my channel. First I was telling you about the most difficult question you've ever got to answer. Now I'm telling you about the genie question to define who you are as a person. You guys just wanted to learn some leatherworking. No pollution and trash. Is that something that you firmly believe in, Nope? Or is it, uh, is it a Miss Universe answer? Are you just being purely selfless? Which is also fine. But, uh, if that is your answer, what do you plan on doing to make it happen because unfortunately we don't have magical genies It's warm.
Well, that's good. Yeah, coming from a country town myself, there's a bit more pride in the environment when it comes to like picking up trash and things like that. And in Australia, we have things called emu parades where all the students go out, put on their hats and sunscreen and walk around picking up trash. And um, then you move to the big city and nobody gives a damn. And it's so bad to witness. So it's good that there are people out there who are doing something for it. But what about your career, Nope? What are you, what are you doing about that? Like, your personal waste management for your shop, is is that good? I hope so. It sounds like it is. I don't imagine you pick up trash and then put it right back again. If you did, it would be like the plot for a Seinfeld episode. But Jerry, you just put the trash back again. See, not everybody wants to change the world, and that's fine. Um, I am kind of in that camp. I'm too much of a pessimist about humanity to want to change the world. But what I can do is acknowledge the fact that I can change my world. And when people interact with me, I want them to come away feeling rewarded, like they've learnt something, even if it's just about themselves. Learning, I believe... in in my view, is one of the greatest joys the world has to offer. You know, self-sufficiency. There's pride in working with your own hands to make your own things. And I want other, other people to experience that, which is why I love spreading knowledge. And um, seeing Sam do the live streams really inspired me to use YouTube as a platform to do that. Because it allows me to reach people like you, Nope, that um, are not necessarily close by at all. But um, nevertheless, I can interact with you, teach you stuff, hopefully. There's probably nothing here that you don't already know, but it's at least interesting. And interest leads to curiosity, and curiosity leads to learning. Yeah, that's a very, very valid point, Nope, because um, you're following a similar path to me, you know, like taking pride in the handmade, um, going back to the the whys behind production, um, and by whys I mean W-H-Y-S, not W-I-S-E, um, because knowing the why behind something is freeing, it's, it's sort of like you can learn how to you know you can parrot how to fix a like 
let's just say you had like a a Honda CRV from 1999, you could get the Haynes manual and go through and learn the ins and outs of how to repair that car. But until you learn the why of various things, like why does that part do what it does? Why it is why things like why does that part do what it does? Why it is why is it there? Why does it need this? Um, you can't take that knowledge and transfer it to a Toyota Prado. Get a Tecron. So until you learn the why, you can't really be self-sufficient and free. And people like blacksmiths or carpenters or anybody who works with their hands, they start generating an appreciation of the why. Like, you start seeing things in a different way because you understand why they're there, why they're done this, the way that they are, and it helps you be better in your own work for the same reason, really. Oh, is Sam's new video out? Yeah, he uploaded that while I've been doing this. So, Techron, we're doing a knife sheath. We're going to dye it when it's finished, but we're just stitching it together at the moment. It's quite thick kangaroo hide, so it's, uh, it's a lot of work to stitch. But since it's going to a, somebody in Germany, I thought they might appreciate getting something made of kangaroo that was made in Australia. It's a bit of a novelty. I hope, at least. And ironically, it's sort of a, a thank you gift because that this guy in Germany sent me a heap of awesome leatherworking tools. It's quite funny. I I had for ages um, a Honda CRV from 1999, back when they were all Japanese made, like your 2000, the um, 98 to 2001, I think, was the last series that was made all in Japan. And they are surprisingly good vehicles. Like, they're, they're really good. At the time, they were really ahead of their time with the features that they had. Like, it's a four-cylinder engine, but it's got that IV tech system in there, so that you it's got that dynamic valve shifting, and um, you get a surprising, surprisingly smooth and powerful ride out of one of those things. The automatic four-wheel drive kicks in if you're trying to tow something, and it's just they're great vehicles and really nice and easy to repair. The engine bay is really nicely laid out. I don't know how much of a, a gearhead you are. Nope, but um, huh, I'm, a, I'm a massive one. I'm not sure, Nope, whether or not you're not watching a live broadcast or whether you've got a delay. You might want to check to see if the word live under the video is red or grey. If it's grey, you want to click on it and jump, jump forward a bit. Well, we're, we're making good time on this one. The last stream this morning was uh, two hours long. And this one, we're 80 minutes in, and we've almost... You know, almost halfway through the stitching, and then we'll just do the um, detail work, and then dye it, and it'll be finished. That means the next stream will be me putting an edge on the knives.
my Honda CRV had a name. I called him Kevin. Because I'm one of those people that has to name everything. So how's it going in your part of the world, Tecron? Hey, I look forward to it. What's the topic? Yeah, mine had a problem with the door latch too, except it wasn't the spring breaking off. It was the um, how the door latch connected up to the door closed switch. Normally it's just like a button system that they've got in cars, but Honda CRVs, as you probably remember, have... Um, like it's, it's interlinked, the latch and the, the door lock and everything is, is interlinked with the digital system which recognises the door's closed. So it would... Um, sort of flicker and the connection would, would go, so I'd be sitting in my living room and I'd glance out the window and see the internal light on in my locked, parked CRV and think, oh shit, somebody's somebody's like pinching my car or something, I'd run down there and then as I run down there it would turn back off again and I'd think, what the hell's going on? It took me ages to work out it's the internal door switches. Oh, nice. Leaf forging's great. I don't know if you guys can hear those butcher birds out the back. They're waiting for their supper. I like to, during the hot months where hunting's hard, I like to give them a little bit of food. And they always come at the same time of day. Well, my wife and I don't celebrate Valentine's Day, Tecron. 
we um, kind of think it's a bit silly that there's one day of the year that you've got to be nice to your partner. We just show our affection to each other every day of the year. So we just completely ignore Valentine's Day. always just a corporate bloody program to sell chocolates and roses anyway. but we're a bit lazy with any of that sort of thing. Like, we have, um, <laughs> we, we automatically arranged all of our anniversaries to fall in the month of April. So wedding, engagement, the day we met, and all that stuff, is, uh, it's all in, in April. And so, so both of us are terrible at remembering dates. And so instead, we just have an anniversary month. And the whole month, we <laughs> we do like, oh, let's have an anniversary dinner and, and stuff. So, um, much easier. <laughs> One of the benefits of having a wife who's just as lazy as you are. When it comes to that sort of thing, at least she's not lazy and normal normal stuff, just remembering anniversaries. I'm terrible with remembering dates anyway. Um, if it's not marked on my calendar or I don't have some sort of reminder on Facebook or something for it, I forget. I once forgot it was my own birthday. <laughs> well, if you both forget it, then you can't get in trouble. Yeah, you get to an age where birthdays just don't matter anymore. It's just another day. Especially if you're super antisocial like me and don't have any and don't like doing parties or anything like that. Like nothing ever happens on my birthday. I don't, don't even like growing up we didn't get cakes or have birthday parties or anything. It was just one of those families, so um I'm used to just not doing anything. Okay, there's the full first round of stitching. Very nice. Stretch that around and soften it up a little bit. The dye will help that. Dye, the alcohol based dyes are very good at suppling up leather. Now we get to go back the other way with the stitching.
bit easier this time because the lining up has already been done. Got my birthday coming up in a couple of months. Thirty two years old. Still just a young spriggan. I think 32. Yes, 32. I'm terrible for remembering my age. I know this is super riveting stuff guys, but hopefully you've gotten something from seeing this sheath get pulled out of a, of a big old rectangle of raw kangaroo leather. Tell you what, I, you know, I know it's a bit of a jump back in time, but we're talking about TV shows that we like watching. Um, one of my favourite TV shows is one that most people, for some reason, don't know about. I think it's because it wasn't on like HBO or anything like that. Or on a big one. It was on a channel called Stars, and it's called Black Sails. And it's a really interesting concept for a TV series. Um, when I was young, I was a massive pirate fan. I used to love pirates, everything about pirates. I wanted to grow up to be a pirate for a while there. <laughs> um, but I, um, I, you know, grew up reading Treasure Island, particularly. And um, for those of you who have never read Treasure Island, it's a completely fictional story. But it is what sort of defined the pirate genre in fiction. Uh, to answer your question, Tekron, kangaroo leather is it's much tougher and drier. It doesn't have the suppleness of um, cow leather. Um, it's, it's so dry that you can carve it like balsa wood. But once you add an alcohol-based dye to it, an ethanol-based dye... Um, it gets quite supple, so you can shape it into really quite good um, 
sort of sheaths and, and things like that um, very easily and, and carve beautiful detail in it and things like that. But then once you actually dye it, uh, it supples up and feels similar to cow leather. Um, the reason I'm using kangaroo leather is twofold. One, it's what I had on hand. And two, this knife is going to a friend in Germany. Uh, hi, Stefan. Um, and I thought he might get a kick out of a Australian forged knife being put in a kangaroo leather sheath. So anyway, um, Treasure Island is a fictional story about piracy in the, um, the golden age of sail. And um, it's sort of the whole peg-legged pirate with a parrot going yar and all that sort of thing. Um, for anyone who doesn't already know this, that's never been the case with pirates. That's not what they're like or were like in real life, the privateers of, of the golden age of sail. Um, however, Treasure Island was a fantasy novel about pirates that made them out to be like that, and it was so popular that it sort of spawned a a whole sort of culture of what you know what we now see as pirates, and it's led to things like Pirates of the Caribbean and all that sort of thing. Um, anyway, it was uh, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote this book, huge success, um, but when the book starts, you meet. Um, characters like um, Captain Flint, Long John Silver, you know, names that um, have echoed throughout history. However, when you meet them, they're already established characters. Like, they have long backstories and histories and grudges and all this sort of thing. And you don't, um, you don't really get an insight as to why they are the way they are. You just know them as that. That's how. That's how they be. And so, um, it, Treasure Island was set during a time where the East India Trading Company um, were trading in the Mediterranean, and oh, not the Mediterranean. Sorry, the Caribbean. And there was there was a lot of piracy. It's just they weren't walking around on peg legs and saying yarr and fighting with cutlasses very much. So, um, anyway, there's record keeping was not great during that time in real history. And so while there are a lot of records of, uh, attacks on ships and pirates and, and all that sort of thing, um, and vessels going down and, and forts being built, and there's a lot of records of it. There's these huge gaps in history, in the history books, in the, in the records, um, huge gaps between recorded history and it's just stuff that's been lost to time that that it's just it never got recorded and so it will never it will never be known what happened in those gaps um and there were these real people that you know Anne Bonny Jack Rackham um Blackbeard Edward Teach his name real name was real people that were around at that time being pirates and and such but because pirates were sort of mismatched, ragtag group of people, they didn't keep any records of their actions either. So, on one hand, you've got Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, one of the most famous novels ever written in human history that's about the pirates in the Caribbean during the Golden Age of Piracy. And then on the other hand, you have real historical uh, record of the events of the time that has all of these gaps um, that they just don't know what happened. So, what this TV series that I, I like, it's called Black Sails, what I like is that it has melded the two together, and basically it, as the events of the series go on, it actually shows and depicts these real things that happen throughout history with real characters from history, um, like Charles Vane and, and people like that, that that were huge players in the Caribbean at the time, but it explains the gaps in the real history. It fills them in with the actions of the fictional people from Treasure Island, like Captain Flint and Long John Silver. Uh, and it melds real history with um, the, the fictional events of um, Treasure Island, creating this beautiful, beautiful flow um, between fiction and reality. And when the series ends... 
Um, it's, it's like five seasons, I think, four or five seasons. And when it ends, the final season builds up to the beginning of the novel Treasure Island. So where it finishes, you could then pick up the book Treasure Island and read it, and it would, you would know all of these characters, and you would know where they came from or what they went through and all that. And it's just the most poetic, beautiful merging I've ever seen. I've never seen anything like it, to be honest. And all the costuming is really great, and the acting's really top-notch. And this, um, you know, it's, it's very modern, but at the same time, very historically accurate in a lot of ways. A lot of ways they've modernised it, you know, to be more entertaining. But um, it's just as gruesome as real life was around there. It's got just as much sex as real life had. Um, it's definitely not a show for kids to watch because that part of history was pretty dark, to be honest. But, um, yeah, other people are obsessed with, like, medieval history or World War II history. I was obsessed with piracy. Man, there was a time in my life when I was a kid that I would tell people I was a pirate. <laughs> I'd turn up to school with an eye patch on and shit. <laughs> Oh, I was obsessed with it. But that show was just catnip to me. It was so cool. And I highly recommend looking it up if, you, um, if you're at all interested, because it's worth it. It's great. Ooh, it's getting windy outside. blowing more hot air around. Oh, you guys are so chatty today. Keep it down. One at a time. Sam won't be able to keep up with the modding. <laughs> yeah, that's my job. I'm going to be back in two seconds, guys. I just need to go and see a man about a dog.
Ugh. All right, back to it. I'm back, Tech Run. So, um, yeah, I was a huge Firefly fan as well. Really loved that series. I was really sad where it ended. I do think they did a good job with Serenity Film, though. What did you think? Did you like Serenity? Some of these yellow alignments are a little bad. <laughs> yeah. I'm always confused as to how to pronounce his name. I think it's Chiwetel Ejiofar. Probably butchering that. He actually played an excellent bad guy. Some people just can't do villain well. Oh man, did you see the trailer that came out for the live action Aladdin? How bad does that look? Like, the guy they've got playing Jafar does not look at all evil or sound evil. Like, he sounds like a high school kid that they've just grabbed and told, hey, be in this fucking high budget movie and they got Will Smith playing the genie and he's trying to do the whole Fresh Prince of Bel Air voice even though he's like 50 now and the guy that got playing Aladdin does not look like a hero character it looks like an independent like high school film with better CG You can tell the public's response by um, seeing the like-dislike ratio on the trailers. But if you want to laugh, if you're a fan of Disney and a fan of the original Aladdin, I still remember when it first came out. It was huge. Like, being in the cinema and watching the magic carpet escape from the, the Cave of Wonders, that was so cool. But then to be a fan of the original Disney one and watch that trailer, oh, man, I got a laugh out of that. Alright, we're in the final stretch now. I watched, um, speaking of bad films, have you ever seen a film that while you're watching it, you're thinking, this is so cool, they've done this so well, it's really well done, and then the ending just ruins the entire film, because, like, from now on in, you can't watch it anymore, unlike another time, because you know that terrible ending is coming. Like, for me, The Book of Eli was like that. Great film, really cool twist even in it, but then... Oh, ruin the whole thing. I won't spoil it for you if you haven't seen it. 
but um, like it was going so well until that point. Um, but recently I watched Bird Box, and that was one of those films. Cool premise, well executed, you know the whole whole thing. But um, <laughs> then that ending. The Blob, yeah, man. I think they could do a good job with that. You know. Get that oozing sludge devouring buildings and flowing down city streets. Or the, the creature from the Black Lagoon would probably be able to do that justice as well. Which one haven't you heard of? Nope. Was it Bird Box or The Creature from the Black Lagoon? Godzilla movies. I am um, not a fan of the old ones. I was a kid when that new one came out that had Matthew Broderick in it. Um, went and saw it on my birthday. That was cool. I liked that. Rewatching it again as an adult doesn't really hold up. Still enjoyable though, to be honest. It's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, Bird Box was a Netflix special, so it, I'm not sure if it's out anywhere else. Um, it's um, It starts out so good, like really good. But it's sort of... The thing that ruined it really was it started out with this woman who was just dead set against not having kids. And it's like everybody around her was like, Oh, you'll change your mind. Oh, you you got to experience the joy of having kids. And she's like, no, fuck off. I don't want to have kids. And then the movie, this incredible thriller horror sort of style thing, is all just a roundabout way of her learning the joy of actually having kids. And, man, it just ruined the whole thing for me. Like, just, if somebody doesn't want to have kids, just let them. The whole world does not have to revolve around people who are fucking breeders. No offence to the breeders in the audience. <laughs> there are people who want to have kids genuinely, and there are people who just don't. Let them be. Either way is fine. Only a few stitches left. Yeah, nothing quite makes you uh, <laughs> idiocracy yet. <laughs> well, you say it's a weird movie, but now it's sort of turning into a documentary. And that kind of freaks me out. People seem to be getting less and less interested in learning things. I got friends who are t high school teachers and they're constantly being told to like lower the bar on students rather than keep expecting the same from them. And that scares me. 
really does. And I'm sure as a uh, handcraft artisan yourself, nope, that um, you probably get the same people that say to you, why do you make that yourself and go through all that effort when you could just buy one? I hate that mentality. It's not about the money, it's about learning to do something yourself, having a bit of pride in what you do. Yeah, respect does seem to be a big issue, but I've heard every generation complain about that. Kids today have no respect, and I'm not sure how much of it is the actual kids ha actually having no respect, and how much of it is me just becoming an old man. A grumpy, crotchety old man. How's that? Look at that. We'll give that the old snippety. Give it a dab of the old super glue. Yeah, look at that. Ooh. Fancy. Nice pressure fit on it too, look at that. So what we're going to do now is cut off the corners so that they round out and then we're going to uh, burnish the edges and dye it and it'll be ready to go. So to round the corners we go back to this tool here. You can see it's kind of got like a little fork at the end of it and a groove on the other side. And what you do is you hook it over the corners. And you can see it peel off and chamfer that edge. There's a little bit of overlap here, so I'm just going to trim that off. Squares thing up, up a little bit. Now Cut the corners off here.
Then we go back to rounding those edges out. Keeps it nice and neat. Can even do the outside edge of the strap. This sort of knocks those sharp corners off. Not that people sit there stroking their leather sheath, but um, if you can make it feel nicer in the hand, why not? That's what I do on all of my work. Okay, so I think we'll dye it before we burnish it. I need some leather gloves, uh, rubber gloves, not leather gloves, that'd be silly. Okay, now the magic happens. Get ready for your prostate exam. Based leather dyes are uh, pretty strong stainers, but we're going with a brandy dye from Angelus. This is my favorite color to do kangaroo leather, so take a good look at it. It's the last time you're going to see it that color. Now 
know, I like to go for an imperfect dye, so I'm not trying to necessarily get the colour as even as I can. I like it to look rustic and worn and old. Look at that. Because it's a hand forged knife and you don't want it to be in some pristine looking sheath. You want it to look rustic like the knife. How cool is that? That's why I went with the black stitching, because it really pops against this finish. Yeah, this is brandy. Love this color on light leathers like kangaroo. No worries, Techron. Thanks for popping by. Always a pleasure to have you on the channel. Next one, I'll be putting the edge on this knife. And another one that I've got. And I'll be doing it by hand. How neat is that looking? Oh, I love dyeing leather. There's something strangely hypnotic about it. I feel like it's been too long since I've comically worked in a reference to my coffee supporter page. My hands are busy at the moment, so if you just imagine that I'm holding up my coffee sign, you should totally go over to www.ko-fi.com forward slash Valhalla Ironworks. The link will eventually be in the description of this video. And you should support my work by buying me a coffee. Funnily enough, I originally tried dyeing leather with coffee. It doesn't work great, to be honest. Um, like, I made extra strong coffee, boiled for a long time, added in some um, leather rub in there as well, like leather butter. It didn't, uh, didn't turn out great. So I just bought the real stuff. It's a bit of an investment. Leather dye isn't cheap, but um, so nice. Nothing beats it. Like, look at this. It took that rough looking, pale, straggly leather sheath and turned it into this gorgeous piece of equipment.
think that'll be that'll be it. Get the rest of this on there. Coffee, coffee, coffee. See if Sam would still was still here, he'd be popping the link up. But I think it's just you and me, nope. Sam's off creating wonderful objects like he always does. Beautiful things. Look at that. And to be honest, ethanol based dyes die, uh, dry really quickly, so it won't take long before I can test this out. Not bad for something hand tooled in the space of two hours, don't you reckon? Not bad at all. But now we'll burnish the edges. So while this is air drying, I'm going to go get a little vessel of water. And I'll show you how burnishing works, because burnishing is like magic. Honestly, I, I can't get my head around how it works. So that's already almost dry to the touch. Good old ethanol based dyes. So just plain water and I have here a burnishing stick and you've got different grooves for different thicknesses like if you're burnishing that it would go in here, this one would go in here or here so it's a handy little thing to have or you can just use the flat of the stick here Take this, give it the old two fingers in, and really wet that edge. Not too much, but just enough. And then you rub it really put those wrist muscles to the test. And it goes from this sort of edge where you can see the two pieces to that. One shiny seamless piece. Like it's sort of fused together. Incredible, I love it. Some people use carnauba wax, some people use honey. I've seen honey used, I just use water. You do get different finishes depending on what you use. I kind of like the effect that water gives. It's a bit more rustic.
It really is as simple as that. There's not much else to it, to be honest. And then you've got yourself a, a nice hand tooled sheath that very much matches the aesthetic of the blade that you're putting into it. Look at that. Yeah. That the brandy really brings out the steel I find. Brass finnings, brass pins. Oh yeah. Looks great. I won't put the knife in because this has to completely dry otherwise I'll get moisture on my blade and then I'll have to get all the rust out of it. So the other thing that you won't see on this stream is that once I have finished completely drying this, which will actually take a couple of days honestly, I want it to be really dry. I could oven dry it but that will actually make the leather go hard and currently it's nice and supple and I want to keep it that way. But one thing I will do is I'll give this a nice rub down with a leather butter, either a leather butter or a Renaissance wax. Renaissance wax is fantastic and well worth investing in, but a nice solid rub down with leather butter and then letting it dry again uh, will help waterproof it, preserve it, make it look great. But there you go. A custom sheath for a custom knife for a very cool guy in Germany who sent me a bunch of leatherworking gear. So thanks, Stefan. If you're seeing this, you this is going to be on its way to you very soon. Hopefully it gets through customs. <laughs> it would be a lot of work to do, uh, go through if it gets stopped at customs. So, uh, yeah, I will see you guys on the next stream. Thank you very much for popping by, keeping me company during a two two-hour live streams back to back um you guys are awesome and i really appreciate you coming by to say hello um and uh yeah i'll see you on the next live stream which will probably be putting the edge on this knife and this knife uh using old-fashioned whetstone method so stay tuned for that not sure when it'll be it's when i get the time basically but otherwise, um, thank you very much for stopping by. Uh, always a pleasure. And I'll see you guys on the next one.